it's hard to imagine we're here at Christmas time already in December, uh, but we want to go ahead and, and uh, uh, tell you Merry Christmas. Uh, thank you for being here this morning. <clears throat> An interesting thing inside of my family is that my oldest sister, my oldest sister, I have two, one older, one younger, uh, when my parents retired, my oldest sister felt compelled to buy the house that I grew up in. And so she still lives there, uh, Geisinger Avenue in Millville, uh, right off of Route 55. And uh, so the, she lives there but has renovated the house that I grew up in. Let me show you, this is the fireplace inside of uh, my home that I grew up in. And my sister, she's a bit of an interior design person, and so uh, she has resurfaced the entire fireplace. But uh, I'd like to invite you, this used to be red brick, uh, just red brick uh, when I grew up. And so many of my family gatherings happened inside of this room. And what prompted my memory this week has been, well... An unusual thing inside of my family. I don't know when it started. I'm not sure how it ever began. But when we grew up around Christmas time, whenever you received a Christmas card from someone else in the family, no matter what age you were, you had to stand on the fireplace and read your Christmas card. Uh, I don't know where it started or how it began. It just became part of our family tradition. Then it moved from Christmas into birthday, into anniversary. And so anytime we were in this room and we're celebrating any sort of an event, you received some sort of a card. Our family on the fireplace was exactly the phrase, got to get on the fireplace. Now, that was not too uncomfortable in my own immediate family with my brother and sisters and my mom and my dad. When it really became fun was when we started having in-laws, right? And, and then we started marrying. And then we had, when we gathered together, it was unusual for people inside of our family they had no idea if you imagine getting some card that expressed your love to another person and they said you have to stand on the fireplace and read your card let me just tell you Julie just is not a fan of the fireplace <laughs> the reason that I even bring that this morning is because you have been giving cards and sending cards and my mind this week has been running to some of the traditions and some of, a lot of the sentimentality around Christmas. Like you, I have Christmas ornaments at my house that are years and years old. Every one of them has a story. Every one of them tells a story. I was surprised after I was married that my mom took all of the Christmas ornaments that I had made and gifted them to my wife. And so inside of a box, not this year, but some years, you can pull out a velvety red Grinch that doesn't even look like a Grinch that I made when I was in elementary school. And then the Christmas ornaments, ornaments of my children hang on the tree. The sentimentality around traditions as well. Gathering on Christmas morning and jumping into bed and reading the Christmas story. I'm not sure what it is about Christmas, but I've been living in that situation in my mind and running back then to the times that I stood on a fireplace and I read Christmas cards from my family. Because Christmas certainly does provoke for me memories of family and the importance of families gathered. Specific foods that were eaten, cookies that were made, meals that were had. Or maybe it's the reality that at the center, at the center of all of our Christmas celebrations is a baby. And so having the chance to see Christmas through the eyes of children is just a wonderful wonderful expression to come and to see our own kids perform musically and tell the story of Jesus in song 
or to watch our children open gifts and see the glory of the gospel come to life as we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ through the eyes of our children. This morning we lit a candle which reminds us of the understanding that God has demonstrated His love towards us in this, that Christ came as a baby. There are so many different songs or poems or expressions in Christmas that remind us that our favorites, one of my favorites is a poem uh, by Christina Rossetti, and you know these words. I love them. I think that they're so descriptive and say so much in a short amount of verse and a short amount of words. You might know a song or two that's been set to this poem. Love came down at Christmas. Love all lovely. I love that phrase. I think that's terrific. Love all lovely. Love divine. Love was born at Christmas. Star and angels gave the sign. Worship we the Godhead. Love incarnate. Love divine. Worship we our Jesus. But wherewith for sacred sign. She continues. Love shall be our token. Love be yours and love be mine. Love to God and all men. Love for plea and gift and sign. In the midst of our celebration of Christmas, in the midst of the sentimentality and the warm feelings that surround family, children, and the expression of God demonstrating His love, I want to say that one of the things that has caught me just a little bit off guard as I've been reading, I've run across this quote several times in the past week. It's from a guy who has a, an amazing academic pedigree, Yale, Edinburgh. He's at Duke right now. His name is Stanley Hauerwas. He's a philosopher. And interestingly enough, I think maybe a half a dozen times I've run across this phrase, that the greatest enemy of Christianity is not atheism. It's not postmodernism. The greatest enemy of Christianity is sentimentality. Now, the reason I want to share that with you is because uh, I've already so told you, I've been kind of living in the midst of the sentiment of my own childhood, my own background, and then too, as you move towards Christmas, I can't help but reflect and think about that. But then I run across this phrase and I begin to wonder, have I lost the miracle of the birth of Jesus Christ, the supernatural appearance of Jesus onto the page of history, and I've confused that with warm feelings of sentimentality I feel good or I want to feel good in the midst of these circumstances but instead says Harawas we long to feel good and emotions set in play but all the while we've confused our warm feelings with the reality of a Christian experience of confronting Bethlehem's baby. And so I want to go ahead and remind you this morning of verses of Scripture that you already know that talk to us about the arrival of Jesus Christ. There are many ways that we could frame the arrival of Jesus onto the page of history, but let me read for you a few verses and let me see if you can pick out the dominant theme inside of this presentation of the birth of Jesus out of Isaiah 9 for to us a child is born a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called wonderful counselor mighty God everlasting father and prince of peace of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end he will reign on David's throne over his kingdom 
establishing and upholding it with justice and with righteousness from this time and forever. Out of the book of Micah and kind of a small minor prophet, chapter 5. Out of Bethlehem will come for me one who will rule over Israel whose origins are from old, from ancient times. In Matthew, this is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. In Luke, an angel said, Don't be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son. The Lord God will give him the throne of the father David and will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. And the angel said to them in Luke chapter 2, Don't be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy to all people. Today in the town of David a Savior has been born. He is the Messiah. And then in these Christmas carols that you're very familiar with and many of you could pull these lines from, out of joy to the world, let earth receive her king. Glory to the newborn king, hark the herald angels sing. And then from, O come all ye faithful, born is the king of angels. Reflecting upon the importance of the incarnation, of God becoming flesh, in his book, Mere Christianity, which many of you have already read, C.S. Lewis thoughtfully said that the arrival of Jesus Christ is like this. Let's go to the next slide. That the earth is enemy-occupied territory. That this is what our world is. And Christianity, Christianity is the story of how the rightful king has landed that you might say landed in disguise and is calling us to take part in the great campaign of sabotage now in Matthew and in Luke these stories talk to us and evoke feelings of sentimentality a young mother not certain to do what to do about a, an unplanned pregnancy, but one that she knows is somehow divine. A young man having the courage not to divorce her. A government which compels them to travel because of a census. And the arrival of a king. In Matthew and in Luke, some of the very images that evoke warm feelings or sentimentality are found. John's gospel is just a little bit different. And in his chapter 1, when he introduces the arrival of Jesus, it seems like it's not with as much sentimentality or warm feelings, but rather John is stating and making a case. Look at these words out of John chapter 1. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. You've heard me reference before that that word dwelling is a word that, well, it just means that He moved into our neighborhood. He built His house in our street. He moved in right next to us. The Word of God became flesh, or the Word became flesh and he made his dwelling among us. We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, the one who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. It's Christmas Eve Sunday. And I wouldn't expect anything less than the reality that that evokes for you and compels in me not only aspects of sentimentality, not only understandings of our memories that kick in, and also the warm feelings that come with family. And at the very center of our celebration, a baby. But can I invite you to think with me for these next 24 hours? Maybe, maybe, just maybe, a bit of a transition for you. 
and for me. Not so much to move into our feelings of sentimentality, but maybe consider the idea of the wonder, the miracle, the supernatural dynamic that happens that God has loved the world so much that He sent His Son, Jesus Christ. And so this Christmas Eve morning, I want to say to you that I, I think that there is a little bit of a difference in our celebration that we want to go ahead and with Hauerwas say, you know, not so much the sentimentality, but the reality. And so I want to invite you to think with me this way. Let's go to the next slide. The word all. And uh, this word is the word like aw, aw. So here, I'm going to go ahead and invite you to say that with me, like, aw, one, two, three, say it with me. That's nice. That's nice. That's nice. One more time, one, two, three. And that's kind of what you would expect at Christmas, right? Oh, oh, look at the little baby. Oh, how about that? There's a young mother and father. Oh, how about? But you know, it occurs to me that's another word that sounds exactly the same. It's this word. One, two, three, say that word, not like the other one. Say this word, awe. This word evokes wonder. This, though, this word evokes miracle. This word evokes something supernatural. This word evokes, I can't believe that happened. Can I ask you, 24 hours, is it possible today that we can make a shift in our worship from, oh, isn't that nice, to, it is compelling that God has loved us so much that Jesus miraculously is born onto the page of history for the salvation of the world. Will you stand with me? Let us pray together. Will you use, Lord, the sentimentality of our past? The things that grab our attention and prompt and cause warm feelings of all to bring us to the place where we have the privilege of once again considering Bethlehem's manger with a sense of wonder that we have already had the chance to sing about. Glory. Hallelujah. It is incredible the lengths that you have gone to demonstrate your love to us. How grateful we are today that love has come down at Christmas. Love all lovely, love divine. Love was born at Christmas. Star and angels gave the sign. Thank you. In adoration and with a sense of awe, we worship. And now unto him that's able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before his throne with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior to whom honor, power, majesty, and dominion belong now and forevermore. Amen. Merry Christmas.